heard it before, but it's worth repeating. Happy Mother's Day to each mother, dear mother here this morning. A day that we honor motherhood, show our appreciation, love, and respect, including our wives, sisters, grandmas, for all their hard work and sacrifice. You heard it said, and I repeat, a man's work is from son to son, but a mother's work is never done. The men question that and the women agree, <clears throat> but just take the time, if you didn't already, to thank your mother, your wife, for all that they do. There's always something that needs to be done, something needs to be taken care of, cleaned up, washed, cleaned, ironed, sewed, folded, and correct, the list could go on. So a big thank you to every mother, as well as young lady here this morning for everything you do for the Lord and for your family. May God richly bless you. I mentioned a, a short list and probably missed more than I said of your day-to-day -day duties, but to the women this morning, if you would list your duties by order of importance, what would be the top three? I'm not hinting that some of your responsibilities are not important, but just wondering what you would say are your top three. You don't have to tell us, but what are on the top three? I'm going to see if I can mention one or two, and possibly all three here this morning. And we're going to turn to Titus 2 and see if some of them are listed here. If you want to turn your Bible to the second chapter in Titus. The topic, the listing of my, for this chapter in my Bible is proper conduct is defined for various groups in the church. So we're going to include a, a, most of us here this morning, if not all of us. Titus 2 verses 1 through 7. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Verse 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. I know it ends with a, comment, but a comma, but we're going to stop there. The three points for the message this morning, we think of mothers as well as I mentioned, all of us, teachers of holiness, teachers of good things, and teaching by a pattern. And the title uh, points to the main theme for the message this morning found in verse 1. The title is Teaching Sound Doctrine. And I think the top priority I'd like to stress this morning is that all women are teaching the younger generation sound doctrine that is found in the word of God. You have heard it said, more is caught than taught. And sometimes in our house, we ask the question, where did that come from? And we're referring to when our granddaughters say something that's just a tad bit out of the ordinary. And I'm not going to take the time to tell you where, who gets the blame for most of those comments. But we wonder, where did she catch that? <clears throat> and the truth is, you know, young ears are sharp. And their minds are able to store a great amount of information. But the question remains that we come back to is, what are we teaching the younger generation? I was extremely blessed by the testimonies this morning and uh, what they want for their children, and that they would uh, accept the Lord, follow his, his leading. Another quote that reveals truth is, what parents do in moderation, our children will do in excess. So we may do something and think, well, that's not a big deal, but what if son or daughter takes it to a new level? What will be the outcome? And then a familiar verse which we're going to look at or talk about a little bit later on here is 3 John 1, 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 
I asked you to list some of your, your top priorities or to your top responsibilities. Was that one of those? I wanted to teach my children truth so they walk in truth. Uh, trust, that's versus something every parent, everyone would desire. What greater joy could we possibly think of than that we would see the next generation walking with the Lord? If we have a desire to see the next generation walk in truth, we need to be teaching sound doctrine. How does this happen? Is it possible for the next generation to walk in truth? It absolutely is. How? Titus 2.1, we need to teach sound doctrine. We need to teach sound doctrine. As the verses I read, verses 3 through 5, give more specific teaching, but call it the umbrella policy. In other words, that everything fits under, and that is found there in verse 1 as we teach the sound doctrine. And I, I believe, and I think you would agree, the need for, for sound doctrine is at an utmost high in our day to day. I think we'd also agree that we're living in a dark world, but we need to be lights in this dark world. People that we meet and come in contact with are looking for answers. Along with that, our children are looking for answers, and our children need answers. And the sad truth is they will find answers somewhere, but before they do that, may we be uh, diligent in teaching them sound doctrine so they will learn the truth. So while the, the focus today is on Mother's Day and we want to focus on mothers, I want this message to be for each one. You know, the verses that I read, they include everyone. Each one this morning should be teaching sound doctrine. So if you're a young man here this morning or a lady without a child, don't write me off and, and sleep. Just this is for each, each one of us. We should all be teaching sound doctrine. Someone, someone somewhere is looking up to you. Do we believe that? Someone somewhere is watching you. Yes, I do believe that mothers and, and grandmothers have a lot more eyes watching them. But nonetheless, someone is watching you. And the question comes back, are you teaching sound doctrine? Here's a challenge. If, if five 15-year-olds would follow you every step of the way for the next year, would they receive a positive example to follow? So tomorrow morning you head for work, you got five 15-year-olds jumping the car with you. If you stop for something, the five go along in with you. If five 15-year-olds would follow you, would they receive a positive example to follow. Mothers, if they follow you around the house, and so on. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But thinking along that, those lines, I thought of uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no man despise thy youth. So now we're taking this down a few notches. But be thou an example of the believers. Okay, so if you're going to have five 15-year-olds follow you, you've you got to be a good example. In what areas? 1 Timothy 4.12, in word, okay, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Basically, every area of our lives. You might say sometimes, well, I just need some time for myself. That's fine. But whatever you're doing by yourself, are you leaving a good example? Are you following, in every area of your life, are you striving for purity? Are we setting good examples in our life? We could ask the question, well, what is sound doctrine? Look at Titus 1.9, I'll read. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Holding fast the faithful word. Clinging to God's word, faithfully applying truth. The word of God is sound doctrine. If we're going to teach sound doctrine, we need to know what sound doctrine is, and that is the gospel message. And then the next phrase in that verse is so, so beautiful. As he has been taught. This morning we're looking at teaching sound doctrine. Was someone here in this verse passed on the faith? Someone was willing to lead by example. Someone was a good role model, for you cannot hold fast an object that you cannot see, and neither can you teach doctrine that's foreign to you. 
Someone passed on the faith. Is that someone you? Are we passing on the faith? Do we know the, the word of God so we can pass it on? For an occupation, in case you're not aware of it, I do not specialize in open heart surgery. Any idea why? You guessed it. I know nothing about it. <clears throat> That's left to those who have studied the fine details of the heart. However, I believe everyone should study the word of God and be able to teach others the truth that is found here, in here. So this morning, you might, well, I'm not a mother. That's fine. Neither am I. But are we teaching sound doctrine? Are we studying the word of God and able to teach? We teach his word in our Sunday school classes. Andrew did a terrific job this morning. I'm sure there were many others as well. We teach it... Uh, uh, in summer Bible school, coming up here shortly, Sunday morning messages, we're in the process, family devotions, in our Christian day school, there's a lot of teachers here this morning, what about Keystone uh, Boys Camp and Girls Camp, we invest a lot of time into teaching the word of God to the younger generation, and we could ask the question why, and the answer is so simple, so, we, so they are well equipped and able to pass on the truth to who? To the coming generations. And that continues, and the cycle goes on and on, generation after generation. If we have a desire to see the next generation walk in truth, we need to be teaching a sound doctrine. <clears throat> Point number one is teachers of holiness. Teachers of holiness. In verses 2 and 3, yes, the fact is there. Paul was talking, referring to the older generation. He calls it the aged men and the aged women. And although we are experts in referring to people as old when they reach a certain age, back up. The truth is that age is only a number. And if you're here this morning and you're 16, well, guess what? You're two years older than the 14-year-old on the bench beside you. I say that to say I think this is for each one. We're all included here. The women in verse 3... Your behavior, your character, or your lifestyle is one that's required to promote holiness. Now, you, you quickly think back over the past week of what was said and done, and you say, well, was I promoting holiness? The women in verse 3, that your behavior is one that becometh holiness. Are you teaching holiness by your lifestyle? If more is caught than taught, are you teaching holy living? You're called to a standard of holiness. Your lifestyle is to, it needs to be reverent, defined as dignified and worthy of honor. Set apart in purity and behavior and thought. <clears throat> I don't think these verses are raising the bar. I think this is, is, is where we, we are at. But women, are we living and moving about in a spirit of holiness as we focus on sacred things? You are a teacher. We are all teachers. Maybe not in Christian day schools, but we're all teachers. Will the next generation listen intently to you if your character is not one that is worthy of honor? A quote from Harold Martin. I quote, No one in the congregation can be quite as influential as a godly older woman. That's profound. No one can be quite as influential as a godly order a woman. And it comes back to what we said earlier, that somebody is watching you. Those five 15-year-olds, if they would follow you step by step, day after day, what would happen when they are 25 and so on? Are we leaving good examples? We remember Timothy. He learned the scriptures from who? His mother and his grandmother. They both saw the value of passing on uh, sound doctrine, being teachers of holiness. Myerstown right here is blessed. May I say extremely blessed with the presence of godly women who are a real inspiration to the family circle and able to add the, uh, the key ingredient of holiness and dignity to our church body. So mothers here this morning, women, God bless you. The older we become, the fact remains, the more life experiences that we have. The more we've learned, the more wisdom we glean, and the better we are equipped to pass on valuable information to the coming generations. Teaching holiness would be directly opposed to conforming 
to the fads and fashions of the world promotes, but rather we're teaching humility and obedience to the word of God. Yeah, we all have a responsibility. Maybe talk to the women a little bit more this morning. But are we teaching humility and obedience to the word of God? Kind of confirms it in 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Who's adorning? The women here. Let it not be that outward adorning, the braiding of the hair, and wearing of gold, and putting on of, of apparel. Let it, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. But let it be the hidden man, may I say woman, of the heart, in which is not corruptible. And here it gets, here's a, another part. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So we're called to lead our lives in a meek and quiet way, which God will look at as a, will notice and consider reverent. Are we teaching holiness to the younger generation? Second point, teachers of good things, also found in verse 3, not given to much wine, but teachers of good things. So along with teaching holiness, we are to teach uh, wholesome content, giving positive advice and valuable information that will assist in building a godly family structure. So, so important. Passing on words of wisdom that deal with the very heart of the home. Yeah, we can teach and train our children, but we need to continue to instill words of wisdom within them. Teaching by example and testimony within the home how the younger generation are to live for Christ in a corrupt and sinful world. And teaching others as well as growing in godliness go hand in hand in, on the side of the things that they are ne were never finished. Never can we say, okay, we're done. We, we completed that. No, we need to keep on growing each day, keep on uh, passing on information and to those coming after us. We're not going to stop and say, I, I matured, I'm, I'm done. We're going to keep on growing in holiness and keep on teaching our children. One of our goals in life should be that our conduct will never undermine the truth nor the attractiveness of the gospel to the coming generation. So we're really uh, talking about our, our behavior. The Bible calls it our conversation. Here we see our, our conduct. Never undermine the truth nor the attractiveness of the gospel. What are we supposed to do instead? We're to build up and encourage our children to do what? To walk in truth. Teaching good things is all we teach in a way that will leave a positive, godly outcome on those listening. As as a teacher, the example of the younger generation, we're to cultivate a, a virtuous lifestyle, especially uh, in the area of self-control, a lifestyle that is deeply rooted in sound doctrine. So we take the word of God as early in the morning with or without a child, and we sit there and we study and we glean and then we apply. In order for us to teach good things, our lives need to spring forth from the roots that have grown deep in the truth of God's word and that's a personal commitment that we take time to study God's word so we know it so that we can teach it on when we are teachers of good things and when sound doctrine is believed and practiced the outcome will produce effective lives and healthy churches it's a good cycle that continues but the responsibility lies back on 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 parents to teach it or even the older uh, people to teach it so that the cycle can continue. Effective lives and healthy churches. Why? Have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. And this is the will of God. And we could narrow it down to one verse, I believe. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So what are we to teach the next generation? We're to teach them the way that they should go. And what is the way that they should go? Titus 2.1, God's way, which is a sound doctrine. The question could be asked, why? And the answer is, so they will cling to the truth and pass it on to their children, to their children, to their children. And the cycle continues. <clears throat> you know, the, the father's role in the home is, is extremely important. And I don't want to minimize that role. But along with dad's role is the mother's influence on the life of her child. An influence that uh, 
is hard to describe, but can I say extremely valuable. Mothers, are we teaching? Are we passing on? Are we promoting holiness? Are we promoting and teaching good things and sound doctrine? So what are we to teach? Well, there's eight traits that are given here. Number one, we see to be sober. To teach your children to be sober. To be temperate or moderate. And moderate. Sober-mindedness means living with a single-minded focus, which would be living with eternity in view. So, yeah, we have a lot of duties, as I mentioned earlier. And you have the, uh, there's three listed, but are we teaching? Is that one of our top priorities, to be teaching with eternity in view? Are we driven by the hope of eternity? Are we carefully directing our children, the younger generation, to live with heaven as our final goal? Are we teaching our families to lay up treasures in heaven? Are we instructing them not to get tangled up with the things of this world? Are we teaching with a single-minded focus in light of eternity? Second of all, love your husbands. Now we're going back into the home. Teaching our, our women to strive for, it with a, for a peaceful home setting. Faithful fulfilling their God-given role. Following God's order of headship in the marriage. And being submissive to our husbands. To their husbands. If more is caught than taught, I believe... Uh, we would all agree at this point is so important. Children can quickly pick up if there's lack of love between mom and dad. So love uh, in the home is key. The, Bible, the, the song writer said there is beauty all around when there's love at home. Women, love with a selfless and unselfish love. Love with a giving and sacrificial love. Love with a quiet and peaceable love. Love with a love of the will as well as of the heart. And love with a commitment as well as an affection. You know, what we need to do if we're teaching by example, we need to make sure that we set the level of love in our homes to the level that we want to see in our children's homes. Are we teaching by example? The next one, love your children. There is no greater call or task on earth than that of being a mother. And in studying for this, come across that someone said this verse seems, this phrase seems to be unnecessary, yet important. Do we need to be told to love our children? I think most mothers here would agree. You don't have to teach that. That's kind of is how it is. But in the world we live in, the answer is yes. We need to promote this teaching. As Zach mentioned, children are a gift from God. Okay? They're given to us. Why? So we train them in God's ways, and then give them back to God to be used for his kingdom-building work. So showing uh, godly love to our children will allow them to see the love of God shining through our lives, then will help them to say yes when, they, when God calls to them um, and knocks on their heart's door when they come to the years of accountability. I think I mentioned this before, but in our home, everyone wants to know where mom, where Mary is at all times because her love and presence in the home is what makes the home complete. You, you step in the door, if you don't see her, children say, where's mom? And you better have an answer. And that, that's a good design. When, when we love our children, they sense that love, right? And they are drawn into that love. And through that, they will be led directly into the love of God where they will be complete. Is there love? in the home do we love our children be discreet self-controlled sober temperate be careful what you say and how you say things be chaste to be pure in thought and action carefully guarding your moral purity keepers at home the highest goal or top priorities for every mother is to make the home a place where order and godliness are clearly seen order and godliness are they evident in your home? You know, it's a high calling to be a keeper at home for the Lord, fulfilling your, your role. Next we see be good. This word here feels elementary, but it means women are to be kind-hearted. Along with that, it's the attitude that is gracious, hospitable, and understanding. It includes being gentle, considerate, and sympathetic. Then we see being 
obedient to your husbands. This thought ties well in with uh, loving your husbands as we saw earlier. Are we carefully following the guidelines God set for us in his word? You know, love and obedience need to flow hand in hand from both the husband and the wife in order to please the Lord. Are we doing our part? And then to drive the point home, Paul tells us that if we ignore these commands, what happens? The word of God will be blasphemed. So within the home, we have our children carefully watching us. And we need to be careful that we don't set a a bad or a wrong example. But also, the people in our communities are watching us. And although many have made the decision not to live like we do, they know how we are to live our lives. So, And the question is asked, are we blaspheming the word of God by being a good example to all we meet? Or do they look on and they know if you're doing right or wrong, are we being a good example even to those who have decided not to follow the word of the Lord? If we have a desire to see the next generation walk in truth, we need to be teaching a sound doctrine. The third point is teaching by pattern. Verse 7, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Let's go back to these uh, five 15-year-olds that have been following you for the last hour. Will they receive a positive example to follow? What kind of life are you living? If they would follow you, would your lifestyle make a difference in their decision to follow Christ? Are we making, are we leaving an impact on the coming generation? Is your life a good pattern for others to follow? Take a, uh, a pattern is a, a model, a guide for making things. So it turns out the same time and time again. Take a dress pattern, for example. I've never done this, but I've seen it happen. You place the pattern on the fabric, and you cut around the edges of the pattern. You can make 100 dresses, and they would all be the same, fitting to perfection. Why? Because you use the same pattern. Yes, that illustration might be debatable. But here, let's go back into my field. When a carpenter uh, cuts rafters for, to frame a roof on a house, what we did is we cut one set and fit them, make sure they fit perfectly, and if they didn't, make adjustments. And then you would use that first one as a pattern and cut the rest the exact same as the pattern so that the end result is a nice straight ridge line because each rafter was cut perfectly to match the pattern. You've done it many times, but you use the pattern and everything else turns out perfectly. Mothers, are we teaching by being the pattern that we want our children to follow without any miscuts? Are we carefully living the life that we are teaching? Do our deeds and our actions match to what we want our children to do? Does our character direct our children to the Lord? I said above all else, well, one of the top priorities is to see that our children walk in truth. If we want our children to walk in truth, we need to walk in the truth. Are we we the pattern that we want our children to be? May 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 we never say, do as I say and not as I do. Bad example, bad pattern, bad everything. We need to live as we want our children to live. Is your life like the cookie cutter, the the same shape, time after time? You stamp it, there it is, time after time. Is that what we are doing? Teaching others is a necessity. Being an example to others is an absolute essential. Are we being a good example, a good pattern? If those five 15-year-olds would pattern their life after your life, or after my life, would the next generation be a good example to follow? Words mean basically nothing when the behavior to back up our words is not there. Without our behavior that backing up our words, we might as well just say, do as I say, not as I do, which we do not want to be caught doing. When people see someone being the pattern, a pattern that is strong, And filled with the fruit of the Spirit, they are far more likely to receive Christ and to live the righteous life themselves. Not only are you being watched, not only are we supposed to be a good example and a good pattern, but by doing that, we're leaving an impact on the next generation. You might be the only person that that, the only one that that person can see Christ through. And if you are that only person, would they say, you know, I want to follow Christ because of what he or she is did, did or 
is doing. Showing a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing, we see here in verse 7, uncorruptness. Here we have, are we being at that clear pattern, teaching sound doctrine with pure motives, pure doctrine, nothing that's undefiled, in gravity and sincerity, with dignity and seriousness. Are we handling the word of God with reverence, presenting sound doctrine for our families <clears throat> with a spirit of, of awe and respect for holy things? Do we, are we taking our responsibility seriously? You know, we're dealing with the destiny of the human soul, and that should be a serious thought on our end as we carefully handle God's word, as we are strive to be a clear pattern for our children to follow after. Is your life the correct pattern that you want your children to imitate? If we have a desire to see the next generation walk in truth, we need to be teaching sound doctrine. So mothers, may God bless you as you fill your role in the home and in the marriage, as you press on each day, filling your duties, teaching sound doctrine. May the Lord be with you and give you wisdom and courage and direction. Shall we pause for a word of prayer? Lord, we come before you this morning. It's just with so thankful, Lord, for each mother this morning. And also, Lord, for the instruction in your word that we can use to train our children for you. And I pray, Lord, that each one here this morning has that desire to see that our children walk in truth. No greater joy than our children walk in truth. So, Lord, we look to you for wisdom and direction, but help us, Lord, to be that pattern that you want us to be so that we can pass that on to those coming after us. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you again for each mother. Just bless us as we go throughout this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Could a song, please? <clears throat>